minutes, uh, uh, which will be roughly 40 minutes of presentation followed by about 20 minutes of Q&A. During today's webinar, you'll be hearing from two SCNM students who are involved in research. Tiffany Turner is a second year student originally from British Columbia, Canada. She completed her undergrad work at the University of Fraser Valley. Guillermo Ruiz is a third year student originally from Texas. He completed his undergraduate degree at the University of Central Florida. Tiffany and Guillermo have been, are very involved in research here at SCNM and they recently traveled to Boston to present some of their research findings at the Society for Integrative Oncology. And I know they'll talk with you about their experience uh, during today's presentation. Today we'll talk a little bit about naturopathic medicine, of course research at SCNM, and then we'll close with just um, some information about applying to SCNM since we are heavy into the application season. And of course we'll answer your questions. So a little bit about naturopathic medicine. Um, since you're here, you're probably familiar with um, naturopathic medicine and our philosophy, but it's always good just to review it. Um, so as you uh, know, NDs concentrate on whole patient wellness, attempting to find the underlying cause of a patient's condition rather than focusing on symptomatic treatment. And naturopathic doctors use natural therapies um, rather than drugs to treat their patients. And of course, NDs follow the six fundamental principles that you see on your screen. Um, the healing power of nature, finding the cause, doctor's teacher, um, and of course, treating the person, preventative medicine uh, being some of the, um, really the ones that, that truly guide the philosophy of the medicine. So to do that, NDs use the therapies um, as an example. Um, of the ones that are, uh, uh, the therapies on your screen are examples of, of some of the therapies that they use to treat patients. So of course nutrition, botanical medicine, acupuncture, physical medicine, environmental medicine, mind-body, minor surgery, homeopathy, um, and of course pharmacotherapy are all of the things that you learn as part of your ND education here at SCNM. So um, if we have, uh, when we'll have time at the end, um, for you to ask additional questions about the medicine if there's something that you want answered. Um, but before we get to that, of course, we want to hear from Guillermo and Tiffany about research at SCNM. So we will go ahead and swap presentations and let them begin. Um, and today's presentation will be recorded. So if you need to um, jump off at any point, know that it will be posted on our website in about a week or so. All right. Well, I will turn it over to Tiffany and Guillermo. Hello. How is everyone doing? Uh, my name is Guillermo. Um, I'm a third-year uh, medical student at, at the Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine. And uh, I originally started in healthcare through, uh, I was working at a level one trauma center. And when I was working there, I got familiarized with the, the technology used to uh, look for different papers and look for evidence behind different uh, procedures. And I started really liking to go into the details of evidence-based medicine. Uh, up until I realized that it, you, doctors use evidence up until it's a convenient. And then I needed to find a different way of practice. And if I wanted to use the real evidence, especially when it comes to like things like nutrition, nutrition is very biased, and I kept finding information completely going against what the evidence or what we were teaching our patients at the hospital. And uh, the more I learned, the, the more I got confused. And that's when I decided to uh, look outside of the box for a better profession for me. And that's how I uh, discovered, you know, I, I would think, I wonder if there's a profession where I could use nutrition and natural um, options before jumping into the pharmaceutical. And uh, lo and behold, I was looking online and I was listening to a, a podcast and the subject of naturopathic medicine came up. 
And it turns out that naturopathic medicine found me, not the other way around, uh, because we've been practicing this way for many, many centuries. And uh, that's how I ended up here. Now, I have no formal education in research. I got my teeth at the lab here at SCNM. And uh, I've learned so much in the past uh, three years. But uh, I am so happy that we're advancing the medicine the way we are. And I'm Tiffany. Um, I'm a second year student, as you said, and I'm Canadian. Um, how I came to naturopathic medicine is kind of a long story, but the, the kind of overall effect of that was I could see gaps in healthcare and how they're affecting um, my family and just losing some family members and stuff. Just made me think that there must be, uh, there must be something else um, that could be more helpful and not just um, as far as naturopathic medicine. Um, naturopathic medicine is kind of the uh, principles that I want to have as a doctor, um, but also uh, it's part of my drive uh, and my interest in research is just wanting to find new, uh, new options for um, these kind of diseases and illnesses that have affected my own family and that will affect my future patients. Um, I, before we proceed, you know, I want, to, uh, I want everyone to know that this is not my effort, this is not Tiffany's effort. This is a school-wide effort. We have over 60 volunteers who are uh, sacrificing an hour a week or more to make all of this happen. And we have faculty members who support us. Dr. Langland, who is the head of research, allows us to do more than, than we have ever expected. It comes with a lot of responsibility, but the things that we're learning and the things that we're doing for the profession are so impactful, and we couldn't do any of this without the support of faculty. Uh, our president, uh, Dr. Mittman, is 100% behind our efforts and doing the little presentations uh, like this. Um, so I want to take Eve because it, it helps me tell you guys what we can be doing for our profession if you're really interested in this or uh, what you can tell other people about why naturopathic medicine works or why there is evidence behind it. So I am very thankful. And uh, that's a picture of the whole research team last year. It, it, every, every quarter, every semester, it uh, keeps growing and growing. OK, so why research? Why is it important to, uh, to follow this research? Well, um, the model of medicine that governs uh, the healthcare industry right now is evidence-based medicine. In order for something to be um, useful or safe or efficacious, it has to be evidence-based. It just so happens that it, within naturopathic medicine, we have so many different things. And we're discovering so many different uh, new modalities and new uh, strategies for nutrition. But in order for it to be accepted by a wide community, we need to have evidence behind it. We need to make sure it's efficacious. We need to figure out what the mechanism of the action of this uh, of these new uh, modalities or of these new strategies are. We need to know if they're safe because let's say you find something that is 100% efficacious in 5% of the community and then the other 95% dies. Well, then we wouldn't use that. And then we need to figure out what is the best way of dosing or standardizing the treatment in order for, for our profession to advance. We need to go to the next level. We know our medicine works. We just now have to prove it and have it um, peer-reviewed to make sure that we gain the respect that we deserve. So there's, oh. <laughs> there's, uh, there's several reasons why student involvement in research is important. Um, for one thing, uh, it helps, to helps you to understand what you're learning inside class is better, but also things you don't even learn in class, you become more aware of. Um, so for bot med, for example, um, I just started taking bot med classes. But even before I started that, I already knew how to make a tincture and what different plants were used for, um, different things about preparing tinctures, different extraction methods. So that kind of gave me a bit of an advantage there. 
Um, you also become more aware of different treatment options, which you don't necessarily learn in class, such as ozone therapy, which is something that has some people use, but it's kind of controversial. controversial. And then also you can learn different ways to approach um, a particular illness or problematic uh, disease state. You can also advance your career by attending conferences. Um, just in attending conferences ourselves, we've met a lot of other students with similar interests, and we've met mentors and collaborators. And those mentors and collaborators, collaborators aren't just for future research projects, which we do have and which are very exciting, but also for your own um, benefit after you leave school, whether you want to open your own practice or you want to work with someone else or if there's just someone you need to mentor you when you're first setting up. Uh, these are all really valuable uh, relationships to be developing. You can also be advancing your career by getting published. So if you've been participating in research for a certain amount of time in the school web projects, your name will go on paper one gets published, which is very exciting. So and, and in other words, research is beneficial for the naturopathic community as a whole and it can be very beneficial for your personal career. Because you open different opportunities. For example, because of research, I, I have uh, developed friendships or I have developed, I, I know my mentors and I can go into clinic now and I know that if I have a patient that is difficult or I need help treating a patient, I can contact one of my mentors and they can help me treat them. And if I find a new way of treating a patient, now I have the knowledge on developing uh, a case study that might lead into a clinical trial, that might lead into a wide acceptance of a particular method of practice. Um, this is very important because once you start building the evidence and the evidence is sound, the whole scientific community has to move with the evidence. So you, will, you, you could be the, the, the catalyst that could make a new naturopathic modality the standard of care for a, for a disease process. On top of that, uh, if you are involved in research, it opens many doors for you. For example, let's say uh, you come to naturopathic medicine and you decide that maybe seeing patients is not for you. Well, there's a lot of um, funding for clinicians and you could apply to a PhD program as a naturopathic doctor that can treat patients, and that's going to open up different avenues for, for funding. On top of that, you could, uh, or you could decide to work for a nutraceutical company developing products, or you can use the, the knowledge that you've gained uh, through research to identify different, different studies. You always hear of things like, oh, coffee's bad for you, and then the next day, oh, coffee's good for you. Well, you can actually go to the source of this information, dissect it, and actually inform the community what the research really says. And that is an invaluable asset and an invaluable uh, skill that you would learn if you are part of research. Okay, so this is like this is going to be a collaborative effort. Both of us are going to talk a little bit about this. How do we balance school and research? Well, I, I constantly, anytime someone signs up for research, I make sure I remember that they came to SCNM not to become researchers. They, be, they came to SCNM to become naturopaths. First and foremost, do no harm. Do not harm yourself by trying to get too involved in a club or research. Take care of yourself first and foremost. If you decide to come to uh, naturopathic school, you should become a naturopath. Um, yeah, so make sure uh, you stay ahead of your classes. Uh, we do a lot of uh, traveling for uh, conferences and things like that, so that's especially important. Uh, we need to make sure that our grades aren't slipping, and my friends really are a big help to me whenever I have to uh, miss classes for research and things like that. So I'm really grateful for that, but I think I scare some of my friends away from research with the amount of time I spend in the lab. So. Just, it's just important to make sure that your studies aren't suffering because of it. Uh, make sure you have a really good support network, and that could be, like Tiffany said, your friends. Uh, my girlfriend at home, you know, uh, she is a saint. 
she uh, takes care of me way beyond what we had agreed to because I'm so involved in research. Um, but the, I, I don't want to scare anyone into saying, oh, you know, once you get into research, you don't have time to do anything. Your involvement with, within research uh, varies uh, to whatever you want it to be. And I, I believe that every single person that comes to naturopathic medicine should have some training in research. That way, when you go to a conference or when you meet someone, you're able to speak the language of science. Um, also, uh, balancing and knowing when you need to stop yourself and start studying and knowing when, um, when you need to really dedicate time because you don't want your grades to reflect poorly on you. We um, just uh, last month, right in the middle of the quarter, we had to go to a conference. And if my grades were bad, I couldn't go to my professors and ask them to change a test or extend the deadline for me because uh, my grades were bad. And so you have to make sure that you take care of yourself, you take care of your grades, and if you have time after all that, maybe you can have some fun with research. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Okay, so now, how do you get involved? Okay, so there's several ways you can get involved in research. Um, First of all, you can take research either as a class or you can volunteer. So there's a certain number of uh, volunteer hours that you need to do within your program. And one way to get those hours is to do research. So if you do research as a volunteer, you can get about 10 volunteer hours for one quarter. And you can do that several quarters. You can also take the Research 6600 class, which is basically the same thing, um, but you get credit for it. So you can get one or two credits a quarter. And you can take this class several times, up to eight credits during your program. We also have, which aren't on the slide, but we also have a meta-analysis class and a case study class. And those are new classes that have just been developed. Um, or you can be a research assistant. So we both spend a lot of time in the lab uh, above and beyond what the school-wide research projects uh, would, would take up. So we have a lot of our own projects besides that. And when, when you get involved that way, you really you can live in the lab if you want to. Um, security guards might kick you out, but that's your only limitation. And I'm going to just um, ask Tiffany and Guillermo a question. So the program of study, for those of you that might be looking at that, does include Research 5014 and Research 5024 in the first year. So can you just talk about those classes being uh, a basic uh, sort of baselining into research and that this would come after that? OK, so uh, those two classes that you've mentioned, are just a class to make sure that every single person that walks through this campus has some research experience. And those are just in class, uh, just dissecting different journal articles or talking about the, the different trends in, uh, in research. Uh, research 6600 is actually a benchtop research class where you are hands-on doing actual publishable research that is that that uh, it, it's a school-wide project um, it takes a couple of quarters and if you get involved for two quarters you get published your name will go on that paper um, anything else no, no that's it. all right how about answer your question yeah perfect thank okay. you so some of our current projects research is just such a broad topic when you when you when someone says oh we're doing research it could mean anything you could be studying uh, flies or you can be studying volcanoes uh, and in at the Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine we decided to focus on three main things we decided to focus on the quality uh, in uh, quality control and safety of natural uh, uh, procedures we decided to focus on the direction of natural medicine or the direct action of, uh, of uh, natural medicine, as in mechanisms of action or how it works, and uh, the investigation of complementary and alternative medicine. And that way, if uh, any of any project lands within those three things or all three, then we pursue it. Um, this is really cool because if you come from, uh, if you're a new student and you started at at, at SNM and you have an idea for a future project. As long as it meets this criteria, we could do it. And uh, that's very exciting because that, that, that's a way of expanding or enjoying your school experience a little bit more. OK, 
Okay, so for as far as quality control and safety, uh, pharmaceutical and allopathic medicine in general are held to very strict standards. There's a lot of research that goes into that. And we're basically trying to just strengthen our own profession and, and have those, those kind of standards for our own profession and putting some research behind uh, the medicines we use and the, the therapies we use. So for example, our latest school-wide research project has to do with testing the effectiveness of antimicrobial botanicals against Staphylococcus aureus and methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Um, so basically, we just looked in the literature and asked different doctors uh, or different naturopaths, what do you use, which antimicrobial botanicals do you use in your practice? And then we went and ordered those, those tinctures and we're testing to see are they actually effective? Is this actually what should be uh, used? And then in the future, we're also going to test those botanicals against a multidrug resistant enterococcus and a multidrug resistant pseudomonas. So that's really exciting. Um, and our results have been very interesting for that that uh, particular project. Um, some of our other projects include marker compound identification and validation. So that's basically just looking at which markers do companies use to check that their products are active and how do those align with the actual effectiveness of that product. Uh, also the optimization of botanical tincture preparation. So you can prepare tinctures using different amounts of alcohol, water, and glycerin and different combinations of those as well. Um, but we don't necessarily know which combination will pull out the active ingredient that we want to use for a particular patient. Uh, microbial contaminants in botanical tinctures is important because if you think about it, you're making a tincture from a plant which has been outside. And just like us, it has bacteria on it. If you have an immune compromised patient, that could be very problematic. Microbial resistance to botanicals is uh, one of our favorite projects because that's our project and uh, so of course it's a favorite but that's basically just looking at antimicrobial botanicals and can bacteria develop resistance to them because some people may think that they can't but we've actually been able to make bacteria resistant to conventional antibiotics by treating them with a uh, tincture which is very scary and then one of the last things we do under this category is tincture longevity studies. So just looking at how the effectiveness of a tincture decreases over time. Okay, and um, if you guys have any questions on any of the projects, uh, we, uh, you guys can ask us later, but we're actually going to highlight uh, the, the project that is on, in yellow. We're actually, I'm going to go in a little into, in depth, but that's the last presentation we made in Boston. But direct action of botanicals. Uh, the characterization of the mechanism of action of botanicals. How are these botanicals actually killing the bacteria? Um, we, the, the evidence is there. You know, we have been using botanical tinctures for hundreds of years. But we were looking at the uh, at, at PubMed and the literature, and no one really has taken the time to see how they actually work. And that's what we're doing. We're doing it. Uh, that's a project that was initiated by uh, by me uh, out of um, uh, just happenstance of where we developed bacteria that was resistant to uh, botanicals, and then uh, we started thinking about what, how, where can we take this, and it's developed into this huge project that is just fantastic. Um, We've all, uh, the characterization of botanical with oncolytic, um, oncolytic activity or how botanicals can fight cancer. And then the characterization of botanicals with antiviral activity. And that's really exciting. That's a really exciting project because we're actually working with a chimera. That's a, a virus that, is, that looks like Ebola, behaves like Ebola, but it's not Ebola. And we're able to kill that virus or uh, uh, inactivate that virus using little plants. So that's very exciting. And um, we're, we're also working on, um, uh, Eric Nelson uh, had this excellent idea. He started looking at uh, this really cool book uh, about the plague and those plague doctors. And maybe you've seen pictures of those guys with the mask with the long, long beak and all of the different things that they stuck on that beak were like rose hips and sage. And he decided to pull apart and tease apart all of these different plants and test 
each individual plant against the plague. And that's a really uh, phenomenal project because right here in Arizona, if you go north to Blackstaff, there has been a couple of uh, uh, outbreaks of Yersenia. So it's not only exciting, it's not only uh, really, it's, it's also relevant uh, to the profession. Um, we're trying to develop a project looking at biofilms as a hot topic within naturopathic medicine. And um, we're also trying to work with different uh, collaborators, trying to design a, a biological assay to test the effectiveness of uh, botanicals for immune modulation. You know, your echinaceas, your curcumins, all of those plants that are really uh, popular right now in, in the health um, sphere. And then lastly, we do some investigation of complementary and alternative medicines. Uh, so in the past, we've looked at the effectiveness of colloidal silver for microbial infections, as well as uh, uh, proliferative regeneration therapy for rotator cuff injuries. Currently, one of our projects is on ozone treatment, and we're treating bacteria, yeast, and viruses uh, to see how the ozone affects them at different concentrations. But we're also going to test it on human cells. So it's kind of not only is it effective, but how safe is it? Uh, to be used on humans. So that's just kind of a, another important safety aspect of that study. Um, we also have a program for case studies. Uh, this is very important for our profession because we're constantly coming up with new ways of treating disease that might be a little bit outside the box. And having the information published and creating a, uh, a track record of uh, efficacy and safety is very important. Uh, for example, we have a synergistic blend of botanicals that is very effective against palmar and plantar warts. Uh, palmar and plantar warts uh, are caused by the HPV virus, which is a DNA virus. Um, and we were able to uh, treat a patient with, uh, with this botanical blend, and it was very efficacious. And then we published the data. So now there's a publication saying, hey, listen, this botanical is safe and effective against the treatment of uh, Palmer and uh, plantar warts. Um, it just so happens that uh, HSV is also a DNA virus, and uh, we were able to treat uh, shingles with that same botanical blend, and that's another case study that we published. Um, another really cool study that was presented during research night during, uh, during the fall was the effects of glutathione to minimize Parkinson's disease. Uh, glutathione has been used in the naturopathic world uh, to treat Parkinson's for a very long time, uh, but there's not a lot of case studies actually tracking the, the, the benefits of using glutathione therapies or any IV therapies. So uh, it was really exciting to finally put something out that says that glutathione is indeed effective to mitigate the effects of Parkinson's. Yeah, so some of our publications have been in both peer-reviewed journals, such as Plus One, Advances in Global Health, and the Journal of Complementary and Alternative Medicine. Uh, we've also been published in naturopathic-specific periodicals, such as NDNR. Um, currently, we have about, what, 16 papers we're supposed to be writing, so. Um, <laughs> but we're <laughs> taking time. About that. <laughs> yeah, we're taking time to talk to you guys about it and not writing, <laughs> so I don't yeah, know. procrastination. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so now uh, I'm going to go into uh, the presentation that we did in Boston. This, uh, this presentation, um, it was a poster presentation that we did for the Society of, uh, of Integrative Oncology. Uh, that's integrative medicine. There were naturopaths, there were acupuncturists, there were MDs, uh, people from NIH, uh, the National Institute of Health, NCI, the National Cancer Institute, and they were so excited about the work that we're doing. This is a poster presentation, and if anyone wants a copy of this poster, uh, there's going to be an email address at the end, and I can send it to you guys. So the way this, this project started is that Dr. Langland found that there's a, um, there's a plant that is very effective against Fox. And this paper was written in the 1800s uh, when uh, settl settlers came to the, to the United States, the New World, and people were dying of Fox there was a uh, Native American population that was using the pitcher plant to treat box, and the success rate for cure was really high. So he got curious about this. It had never been studied. He went ahead and did a couple of extras, and it worked. 
So now we were like, well, this plan works against Fox. Let's see what else it can do. So um, we decided to uh, treat this. This is this slide is uh, really interesting. So you have uninfected cells. And then if you infect the cells with SV40, which is a type of DNA virus, those cells just lice. They just die after they've been infected. If you treat those uh, infected cells with Sarsenia, that's the pitcher plant. So you can see SV40 plus uh, Sarsenia. You can see it. Oh, no, I guess I don't have a clicker. Oh, right there. You can see uh, the SV40 plus Sarsenia. I don't know what you Okay. Um, the, you rescue the cells. And then if you add the Sarsenia to uninfected cells, nothing happens to the cells, which is really interesting because that means that the Sarsenia or the pitcher plant is only affected the virally infected cells. Now, uh, it's important to, uh, I, I, I feel it's really important that SV40 is a type of uh, virus that has uh, cancer properties and if, uh, it can develop into cancer. So after we, we saw that, we said, well, you know what, let's treat cells with different, uh, uh, cells that are contaminated with SV40 or that, are, uh, that have cancer in their genome. Uh, let's, uh, let's try to uh, put different concentrations of Sarsenia. And you can see uh, after six days, uh, if, if you don't, uh, the infected cells don't die, they continue reproducing. But if you add different concentrations of the, of the botanical extract, they die. Um, the funniest thing was that the cancer cells dies, die. But we also uh, did the same thing with normal cells. And you can see the HFF1 cells and the bronchial epithelial cells. Um, and no matter how much sarsenia we put on, that, uh, on those cells, they survive. Meanwhile, the cervical cancer cells that are HPV positive, or CHAT cells, and the C338 cells, which are uh, cervical cancer cells, HPV negative, meaning there's no virus load anymore on those cells, they're just transformed. Those die as you increase the concentration of Sarsenia, which what, what that means is that this extract was, was very good for killing cancer cells, but sparing non-cancer cells, which, which is the holy grail of chemotherapeutics. You want to kill the infected cells, and, and the cells that are not infected, you want them to survive. So then we start thinking, what's going on? How is Sarsenia working? And um, what these viruses do is whenever they infect the cell, they bring two different proteins with them, E6 and E7. What E6 and E7 do is they capture P53, and P53 is uh, this protein within the cell that alerts the cell that has been infected, and it takes it into apoptosis, or the self-destruction of the cell. What E6 and E7 uh, uh, capture the P53 and prevent the degradation of the cell. So the cell continues to, evolve, uh, to uh, reproduce, and that's how it becomes cancerous. Our hypothesis was, that the Sarsenia was somehow blocking E6 and E7, rescuing P53, and allowing the, the P53 to do its job and take the cell into apoptosis. Sure enough, it worked. As you can see on the, on the top side of the slide, um, you can see the levels of E6, HPV-specific E6 and HPV-specific E7 drop as the concentration of Sarsenia went up. And the P53 levels, which is the rescue mechanism to take the cell into apoptosis, go up as you increase the concentration of the botanical, which is very, very exciting. So the next step is, will it work on a person? Because it's really exciting to see these results uh, in vitro, but what is, what is the application right, in, a, in a human? Well, this, this uh, slide right here is a, um, a patient that came to our clinic with really bad palmar warts. Those are uh, just like your regular warts, but they were like on steroids. And you can see uh, they were really uh, painful and unsightly. Um, she had the cryotherapy where they freeze the, the wart and, it, and nothing happened, the warts came back. 
she had a cancer in treatment, which is basically like an acid that they put on the wart to try to kill the viral cells. Uh, but if you leave one viral cell behind, it can come back, and it came back. She was scheduled for surgery, and we treated her with our botanical blend. And you can see, after one week, you can see it getting better and then better, and at four weeks, there was complete resolution. That is so exciting because this is just a cream. This is something you apply to your palm, and it's uh, and it it's you don't have to go it, or get sedated. And it was completely curative. The other the other procedures didn't work, and this one did. What's really exciting about um, about this botanical blend is that there are so many nuances within the plants that make them so cool. For example, Cercenia is a carnivorous plant. And as a carnivorous plant, whenever an insect lands on it, if that insect is in pain and starts like moving around, it can destroy the plant. So Cercenia naturally has endogenous anesthetic properties. So whenever you apply it to a painful wart or, or, uh, or painful shingles, those anesthetic properties translate to humans, and then it's going to provide relief to the human too. So it, it, it helps with compliance from the patient. So that was our presentation that we had in Boston at the Society for Integrative Oncology. Uh, we also have presented research at the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians Conference, and that was in Oakland. And the one we presented there was on antimicrobial or bacterial resistance to antimicrobials and also the mechanism of action that we were studying. Um, we've also had our research presented at the Arizona Naturopathic Medical Association Conference. Uh, SCNM also has a Discovery Day, which maybe some of you have been to. And we also have research nights twice a year. The one research night focuses on research that the residents have been doing, which is mainly case studies. And then the other research night focuses on what the students have been doing, which is more bench talk research. Um, what's also really exciting is the conference we have coming up next year in July, which is the International Congress of Naturopathic Medicine medicine, which is in Barcelona. So we're going to have two poster presentations there, and that is incredibly exciting. So uh, that's a good segue to invite anyone who's in Arizona to Research Night 2016. Um, we're going to have uh, a Research Night on Friday, January 29th, and that's when we're going to be presenting our personal research, the stuff that we're working on on the bench top. We have, uh, we're going to have around five presentations or six presentations. And then we have time for meet and greet with uh, some of the people that are involved in this. And that's a way to get acquainted with what we're doing. This is completely open to anyone. Even if you don't have any science uh, background, we make sure these this presentations are accessible for everyone. Last year, we had a group of uh, high schoolers come in and sit in and have, you know, just to whet their appetite for science because it's so important. It's so important to be well versed in the sciences. And uh, well, that concludes our, pre our uh, presentation. If you have, if you want a copy of the poster that I presented, you can email the research at scnm.edu. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm going to give it to Eve, and she can moderate that. Great. Thank you so much, Guillermo and Tiffany. Um, I. That was fascinating. I think the work that you're doing is fascinating. The outcomes are going to be so beneficial to the profession and the public. Um, and I'm also just on, constantly amazed at how students really direct the direction of their research and have so much say um, to really influence what they want to do and to move that along. So I think that's really wonderful. Um, so please, at this point, type in your questions for Tiffany and Guillermo about their presentation how you can get involved with research. Um, and at the same time, if you have questions about student life at SCNM, um, they would certainly be um, great uh, individuals to ask uh, those questions as well. So while you're typing and uh, thinking of your questions, I'm going to um, switch over to um, another presentation and just talk very briefly about applying to SCNM since we are in uh, application season. Um, and then, of course, if you have any questions about that, we'd be happy to answer those as well. And I'll just go through a couple really quick slides, and then we'll get to your questions.
Um, so uh, you do, uh, as many of you are probably aware, uh, need a bachelor's degree to apply to SCNM. Um, and in addition, we also require students to take prerequisite coursework. So um, for those students that um, have been pre-meters or are pre-meters, these are classes that you've probably taken. Um, if, the, if you have discovered naturopathic medicine maybe after finishing your degree, or if you're not a science major, um, then you would need to go back and take these classes. Um, and we do offer a service to, um, to evaluate your transcript. So if you are considering applying to SCNM and don't know where you fall with these coursework, uh, send us in copies of your unofficial transcripts, and we'll be able to tell you um, what classes you've met and what you still need to take. So we are um, currently accepting applications for our spring start, which is in April, and our fall start, which starts in October. We do accept applications through NDCAS, which is a centralized application service um, that allows you to apply to other schools in addition to SCNM with one application. Um, the application fee for one school is $115. And then students that meet the requirements um, would be invited for an in-person interview. And again, if you're not sure if you meet the requirements, um, send us in copies of those transcripts, and we can uh, evaluate them. Okay. So um, at this point, we want to answer your questions, again, about the presentation, uh, applying to SCNM, or student life. So um, go ahead and type those in. Um, all right, so a couple of questions. Um, so one question is, um, if we are still an undergrad, can we volunteer to be a research assistant? And I actually heard um, an undergrad ask Dr. Langland this question at research night, so I will channel him uh, and answer that. And his response was, um, not at this time, unfortunately. Um, so SCNM, um, because of all the exciting research that we're doing, is really looking at expanding our research facilities and our offerings. And at that point, we might be able to take on undergrad students. Um, but at this time, research is really limited to SCNM students only. Um, and so that also hopefully answers the other question if we accept research volunteers from the community. Um, again, at this time, it really is just limited to SCNM students. Um, but we hope that that's something that we can continue to grow in the future. Um, so are students required to complete uh, CITI training before initiating a research project? And I, not being a researcher, don't even know what that is. So I hope that Tiffany and Guillermo do. Uh, so when we direct our own uh, projects, or when we come up uh, with a project, uh, like I said, I have no research training beyond, uh, beyond what I've learned here. So no, you're not required to create, uh, to uh, take CITI uh, training. But Dr. Langland uh, is a PhD in virology with uh, plenty of years of experience. We work with the Biodesign Institute at, a at ASU. And uh, anything we publish is going to go through so many editors before we go, uh, it goes and gets published that uh, no, you don't, have to, you don't have to complete. But by the end of your, uh, if you decide to get involved in, in research, you're going to be so well versed in research that you might want to go and do uh, extra training. Like for example, I just completed a uh, writing in the sciences course from Stanford um, that was so useful, especially with now with all these different um, papers that we need to write. But no, you're not required. Wonderful. Um, so there was a question uh, or a request to put the prerequisites back on the screen. So that's why I moved the slide there. Um, so I do want to segue something that Guillermo mentioned, which was um, Dr. Langland's involvement with ASU Biodesign, um, as there's also a question about that, if the research takes place at SCNM or at the ASU facility. So Dr. Langland um, has a joint appointment here at SCNM and also at Arizona State University, which is our university down the street, um, also the largest in the country. So there's really a lot of great benefits that come from being in such close proximity to them. Um, and so um, I'll let Guillermo and Tiffany speak to it. The majority of the research happens here um, on our campus. There are select projects that would happen at the ASU Biodesign, but I'll let um, Guillermo fill in. Um, we want the research to stay at SCNM. We, and uh, the more we keep it at SCNM, the better we're going to be at it and the better facilities we're going to eventually get. Now, uh, with all research, there's collaboration. 
So uh, sometimes the, you know, no one can have every single piece of equipment, equipment that you need. So we might go to ASU and with the help of Dr. Langland run a couple of gels or maybe a microarray or different things like that, you know, a mass spectrometry or uh, whatever needs for, uh, to be done for this project to be finished. But we have a rule that in order for us to pursue a project, it has to be feasible to be done at SENM. If we need outside help, then we can contact other universities or other uh, professionals that can help us. But we want that research to be done here at SEM so everyone has access and can do it and uh, be part of it. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you both. Um, so there's also a question um, that's asking about, you know, having been involved in research as an undergrad student and still, uh, the question is, would, they, would the students still have to take the research, the required research class that we have at SCNM? And the answer to that is yes. Um, that is part of our program of study. Um, and again, as Guillermo mentioned, that class is more about laying uh, the foundation of, um, of, of reading research articles and journals. And even though that's something that you may have taken or have had exposure to as an undergrad, it is part of the program of study. Um, we typically, um, if you have done research at a, uh, at, as a master's or a uh, PhD level student, we would potentially consider waiving that um, class, depending if you took uh, coursework that was similar. But we unfortunately can't waive classes that were completed in undergrad, since here we're um, just at a different level of education. So great question. Um, on top of that, uh, you don't want to miss a class. Dr. Langland teaches it, and he's like the most fun professor to have. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun, and he really focuses on topics that are important for our profession. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, every, every time the class is taught, that someone raises a question that probably will spin into a project. For example, uh, a student a couple of years ago said, well, bacteria can't develop resistance to botanicals because botanicals are, are natural. And Dr. Franklin looked at that student and said, what does that even mean? And then we completely changed the course of research. And now we have some awesome presentations dealing with that problem. So yeah, no, it's very important that those topics are so uh, relevant that you don't want to miss that class. Awesome. So um, there is a follow-up question to review the classes that students have to attend in order to be involved in research. So again, as part of the program of study, meaning those are the classes that you have to take um, to get your ND degree, as part of that program of study, in your first quarter, you take research 5014, um, and then in your second quarter, you would take research 5024, and those are required classes for, as part of that program of study. And then if you're interested in doing additional research, you would either sign up as a volunteer and also for Research 6600 um, to, to get uh, involved even further. Anything you'd ask? Yes, yeah, so you can start doing uh, Research 6600 or volunteering for research after quarter two. So after you've already done those uh, research classes and after you've taken micro lab, those kinds of things. So after quarter two is when you start having fun. And this is to protect uh, our students because the last thing that we want is for someone to get uh, involved in too many things and then not be able to deal with the pressure of medical school. This is medical school and you have to make sure you're passing medical school. So once you finish with quarter two and once you know that you can handle the load, then yeah, there's more work than need, that, that uh, we can ever do. But yeah, we want to make sure that you have the basis and you know what you're getting into. Great, thank you. Um, all right, so shifting gears a little bit, um, we have a couple questions about application requirements. Um, so uh, we have a question that's asking, um, what's the main thing that we're looking for applicants to convey in their personal statement um, or their application essay? And um, so there are uh, very four specific questions that we ask you to answer, um, and that's how you see the profession evolving, your place in it. Um, but the, of course, the other piece that we want to, uh, you to answer in that is why this is um, the profession that you want to be a part of and what brought you to that profession. Um, you know, that's really, uh, that's incredibly important, um, of course, in addition to your reflection on um, the role of the profession um, within the healthcare system. But the interview panel wants to know why 
of all the different medical fields that you can enter into, why this is the one that you're choosing, um, and really sort of what your exposure has been to it that's led you to that decision. Um, so in the case of Tiffany, whether it's been personal experiences, um, I know that some of that has been the case for Guillermo, or like Guillermo said, whether it's been sort of what he's observed in a more traditional environment, and, not, and knowing that he wants to be a part of uh, a different answer to that, that, those are the types of things that they're looking for. Um, so there is uh, another question um, about the online classes, um, that online science classes that we recommend. Um, and I will say to that student, definitely send us in your online or your, uh, your transcripts. We do not allow all science prereqs to be completed online. Um, it's very important that you have the experience of doing some of those courses um, uh, on the ground, especially the lab components, um, since, that, since that will really replicate what you'll be doing at SCNM. So send us in your transcripts, and we can talk about that, um, and we can talk about that uh, more one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so uh, another question. Uh, about the program of study and sort of just some uh, some uh, clarification around that. So the program of study, when I refer to that, that is the um, the four year um, uh, sequence of classes that you have to take. Um, and I can take you when we're done here to our website, and you can see really what that says is that you have to take classes with within sequence um, for any given quarter. Um, and that's what I mean when I say program of study. So really, it's a fancy way of saying it's all the required classes that you have to take to become an MD. Um, all right, so um, there's also a question for Guillermo and Tiffany um, about your favorite part of being a student at SCNM. And since both of you moved from out of state, what that transition was like for you. Um, well, I love being here. Um, when, I, when I came down for... Uh, well, I was actually here for vacation, and I knew there was a school here, and I was like, oh, let's just drive by. And then I was like, oh, they have a Discover Day. Let's go to that. And I initially had never planned to come to SCNM, but uh, when I came to the Discover Day and everything, everyone was just super friendly. Um, I loved the atmosphere. Um, I got looking into the school more, and because of my interest in research, I felt like this school was definitely one of the best to give me uh, opportunities to participate in research. Um, so those were actually, uh, that was actually an important factor in my decision to come to SCNM. And my transition to living in Arizona and student life has been fairly easy, uh, partly because I just have, I made so many friends just from the beginning and we stay together and um, we just have a lot of fun. So it actually has been, it has been pretty uh, straightforward. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, I really enjoy uh, research. I don't know if you guys know that. Uh, but um, the, the coolest thing about SCNM and, and naturopathic medicine in, in general is that you can really mold or create your own path. Uh, when, uh, during my first quarter, you know, I, got, I, I, came through, uh, I, I came to naturopathic medicine through research, uh, researching diet specifically, and, and what the, the American, uh, uh, you know, uh, the standard American diet tells you to do and what the science actually says. And I remember uh, being in class and or during break and talking to one of my professors, Dr. Schmidt, about intermittent fasting and how cool it is and like all the science behind it. And then he sent me a couple of papers on intermittent fasting. And then we had like a conversation on intermittent fasting for like a month. And that's the type of culture that we have here at SCNM. You can approach any one of your professors. Dr. Langland gives me so much latitude to do whatever uh, I need to do in order to make me uh, a better candidate as a, as a naturopath, as a person. He mentors me, and, and that's throughout the school. I am becoming a better doctor because of the opportunities that I've made for myself and the opportunities that my professors have given me, for example, to go to Boston in the middle of exams. And they said, oh, this is for school, this is for your career, go ahead and do it, make us proud. And then we come back 
and then we have a lunch reception where we explain what we did in Boston for the community, and people would come in and and uh, but listen to us talk, and you guys are listening to us. So it's just making me a better uh, doctor. Just being, just having the ability and the opportunities that that SCNM gives me. Great, thank you so much. Um, and Tiffany mentioned Discovery Day, so um, great opportunity to mention that. So for those of you that haven't been to campus before, um, there's a, we start, we invite you to come and see uh, our community firsthand. And there's a number of different ways that you can do that. So Discovery Day um, or our, our big open house is one way to do that. Um, we have that twice a year. Um, the one in fall just passed in November. Um, and then we are in the process of setting the date for the one in spring. Um, historically, it has been in March, um, again, on a Saturday. Um, and we'll be posting that date hopefully in the next few weeks. Um, we also have a student for a day program. Um, that is typically on Mondays and Thursdays, as long as um, uh, school is in session and we're not on a break or uh, during finals time, students can come in and sit in on classes, um, as well as sit in on clinic shifts um, in our on-site medical center, um, just to get a sense of what that experience is like. Um, and of course, if you want something, um, uh, just want to come on campus for a tour, we always welcome um, the community to come in for that. And we have set tours every day at noon, um, which are given by students. Um, but of course, if that time doesn't work for you, we're always happy to accommodate. All right. Well, we are um, at the point where we are running out of um, time. So if your questions weren't answered, um, certainly follow up and send me an email here. Um, and we can follow up one-on-one. Um, -on -one. Um, but I want to, again, thank Tiffany and Guillermo for um, their energy, their passion, um, and most importantly, for taking time from their busy uh, day from studying and doing research to share this information with you. Um, again, if you have additional questions, you can email me, um, and I can forward those to Tiffany and Guillermo if you didn't have a chance to write down uh, the research email address. Um, we um, in the admissions department are here to help you on your journey. So if you have any questions about anything, um, by all means, reach out, let us know, and we will follow up and make sure to get all of your questions answered. So thanks again to Tiffany and Guillermo. Thanks to all of you for being active participants on today's webinar. And we look forward to helping you um, become naturopathic physicians and deliver on that dream of yours. So thanks again. Um, happy holiday season to you. And let us know how we can help. And with that, we conclude this webinar. Thank you.